All right, and now it looks like it is one o'clock. So Alan, I will go ahead and hand it over to you um, to kick this off. Um, and as a reminder, please use the Q&A function for us. Thanks everyone. Sarah, thank you so much. And I'm Alan Harned, director of the Virginia Clean Cities Coalition. I'm extremely excited to be here today with folks on a recorded session. Uh, for the most part, we won't capture, um, you know, uh, too many folks other than the, the speaker, but we do want to um, remind people that this is recorded. This will be posted up onto websites so that folks will have access to content and technologies. I am joined today by Michael Scarpino with the US Department of Energy and by Aaron Belt with the Virginia Department of Transportation. We're gonna have a really great session today. And I wanna encourage everybody to use the questions feature, or if you're having trouble with that, to try to um, get our attention in some some other manners. We will be doing Q and A um, at the end of this program. Um, just next slide. Um, uh, just wanted to do a quick introduction to why we're having these types of calls. There is a U.S. Department of Energy and a federal program called Clean Cities Program, which advances energy, economic, and environmental security in the transportation sector by supporting local um, change to reduce petroleum use in the transportation sector. It's actually celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. Reduced petroleum consumption leads to reduced emissions, including reduced greenhouse gases and a reduced dependence on petroleum. And the uh, effort is collaborations between government, industry, and academia. Next slide. And if you are joining us from other parts of the country, um, uh, wanted to remind folks that there is a network of nearly 75 clean cities coalitions. There are uh, departments of transportation in every state with electric vehicle planning and alternative fuel planning. There's uh, Department of Energies in every single state. So just wanted to flag that these local partnerships are accessible um, nationwide. And especially if you are uh, partnering or engaged in Maryland or West Virginia or other active areas, we are closely aligned and collaborating with those efforts. Next slide. Um, Virginia Clean Cities is here at James Madison University in the Shenandoah Valley working on a range of technologies and programs. And I just wanted to take a quick slide and a moment to thank Sarah Stalkup jones for um, uh, facilitating these slides and these programs, especially when I sent her slides in the wrong format size uh, with the rest of the team. Um, we also have Matt Wade down at the American Public Works Association Conference today. I'm Alan Harned. We have Bruce Vilk, who is our electric vehicle uh, program manager working on a range of different programs. Um, and then also two other team members um, who are with us today, uh, Kat Thompson, um, as well as Ian. Um, and I just wanted to flag that we are all working together with a shared vision to reduce the financial dependence on um, imported, imported oil. We have opportunities to save a phenomenal amount of money in Virginia, but also to save lives and to recirculate uh, resources um, in, in, in and throughout Virginia. Next slide. I'm not gonna go into all of the Virginia Clean Cities programs, but there are other grant programs beyond the charging and fueling infrastructure program out there. There'll be programs for school buses. Um, we've obviously been doing a lot of work in rural Virginia. We have a Mid-Atlantic partnership and a range of different programs. I do want to flag that this week, the Port Green Operator Program launched a zero emission vehicle uh, infrastructure uh, uh, vehicle program, about $200,000 per vehicle for zero emission vehicles. Um, and that would be an incentive for dray truck operators. So big truck operators out of Virginia's ports. Um, but these projects that are active lead us in the Commonwealth of Virginia to seek support for all entities um, in programs like CFI. Next slide. Wanted to flag that there is data available for folks looking to do planning. You could look up the EV Watts project. And this is a link from a live interactive dashboard where you can find more information about how electric vehicles operate in Virginia, but also in the region, the EV Watts dashboard. Some of this information could be helpful for planning for electric vehicle infrastructure grants, for example. Next slide. And we've also published a lot of electric vehicle data in collaboration with Virginia Department of Motor uh, Vehicles, as well as other state agencies, DEQ and Atlas Public Policy on Drive Electric Virginia, the website. And the new tool um, that has uh, recently been updated is the Evaluate Virginia tool, which does give localities and all, all sorts of information about how many vehicles, electric vehicles are on the road registered in Virginia, as well as 
uh, plug-in hybrid vehicles and the locations and capacities of the vehicle uh, charging is reinterpreted in a really wonderful tool policy wait VA tool um, if you'd like more information about charging next slide and our mid-atlantic electric vehicle charging uh, project did um, uh, build right, mapping tools including the M tool argon I uh, wanted to flag that data is available and downloadable for all planners um, as you make as you make decisions and, and actions next slide and one of those actions is recognizing and understanding where disadvantaged populations are that are prioritized by U.S. Department of Energy or U.S. Department of Transportation with the electric vehicle charging Justice 40 map. This map will show you the alternative fuel corridors. It will show you the locations of DC fast chargers, and it will also show you information about disadvantaged uh, groups. And each of these maps are interactive, and each of these maps have layers that individual planners can download and, in, and, and input into your own program. So there is some air support for these programs. Next slide. Just to uh, uh, briefly touch on some of the things that Mike will be covering as well. The federal government is seeking to do a uh, large scale national network for um, transportation infrastructure. In this case, they are looking for a national charging network for a great customer experience, affordable charging, reliable charging, and charging for all people, any driver, any electric vehicle, anywhere. Next slide. And we'd be very happy to talk to folks uh, at any time on their journey about what an electric vehicle charger is. But for this project, there's corridor charging or DC fast charging in communities. That is the big charger port. Um, you may have seen these chargers out there. And there's going to be some specific charging capacity that the Department of Energy seeks for those types of chargers. There's also level two chargers. These are the standard vehicle chargers for all vehicles. Um, a 240 volt circuit uh, for a level two, maybe a 40 amp circuit would be appropriate. Uh, DC fast chargers, we'd be looking for maybe 408 volts, possibly 300 amps. Um, and there's st American standard charger ports. They're very friendly. They, um, the top of the DC fast charger uh, looks just like the regular J1772 charger. Plenty more information is available about these charger technologies, and it's a good place to start. Um, how long, uh, how low cost can we get things, and what is the, um, what is the charger dwell time? Uh, oftentimes, um, we try to go for DC fast chargers first and all the time, but there's going to be some limits, uh, financial limits and capacity limits. Um, we want to be sure that folks are aware and um, engaged as they see fit. Next slide. Mostly because the DC fast charging under the CFI program and now under all DOT programs are likely to follow this type of designation where every 50 miles, these chargers would have at least the capacity to service four vehicles simultaneously and at least at the capacity of 150 kilowatts throughput to each vehicle. So these are now the standards. When we talk about DC fast charging under DOT programs, we will want to talk about the CCS charger and four pretty big chargers at each one. If you add up 150 times four, you get about 600 kilowatts of energy capable at that site. And in Virginia, we start to reach demand charges at about 60 kilowatts. So it will be very important to speak with your utility early and often in DC fast charger products. Next slide. I focus on electric vehicle charging minimums as the rest of my presentation, which is just to say that I thought that the easiest method or the most appropriate method to introduce this was to show you the live text from inside the minimum standards documents. And again, the minimum standards will be four ports and using the combined charging system, CCS1 type connector as a minimum. You could add more ports and more charging connectors as you see fit. Next slide. Um, simultaneously, the chargers will give 150 kilowatts, or the level two chargers must be capable of providing at least six kilowatts. That means no more shared chargers that could only do three kilowatts if you're using two ports of the same of the same unit. This should be very achievable under a range of different procurement scenarios. And for local governments and state governments, you can purchase off of uh, uh, online systems like SourceWell. 
and then also James Madison University has done some initial procurements, please make your procurements writable so that all can um, benefit in those capacities. Next slide. Um, as we look at four ports and um, uh, some of these DC fast chargers, Virginia also has some uh, requirements in place before the desire is, is in place to put out highway signage. And um, for fuel in Virginia, we do seek those chargers to be pretty close to an interchange. We would like information about tire repair. In Virginia, we also ask those facilities to be open or accessible 16 hours a day, seven days a week, so not closed on all nights and weekends. And then also um, for uh, highway signage and highway corridors, we would seek access to a public restroom with full sanitary facilities. And please imagine if people are stopping to use your DC fast chargers, um, that that is gonna be one of the key uh, things that they will want to use if they're there on a highway trip, stopping for, um, for 45 minutes. Um, uh, wanted to also mention lighting and a convenient fuel experience are expected um, in the Commonwealth of Virginia's signage and uh, fuel programs. For level two, uh, so for DC fast chargers, that is three phase power, 600 kilowatts, Again, please talk with your utility. For level two, it is 240 volts, about 40 amps each, and 60 kilowatts per port. And so you can start to also rack up, you know, maybe even needing a 200 amp service uh, or greater um, to uh, supply those, those units. These programs, CFI, are also eligible for compressed natural gas, including renewable natural gas, hydrogen, including renewable hydrogen, and propane. Um, although propane vehicles need to be able to service propane powered school buses, heavy duty uh, propane vehicles. Next slide. So when you talk to your utilities, I'm very excited that our drive project has led towards capacity mapping being widely available in some utilities with the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, this information is also now public and downloadable. And I just wanted to flag that Dominion Energy has this electric vehicle capacity tool this will show high voltage three phase primary circuit capacity and how easy it may be accessible to facilities um, that you may plan for. And on the example of this slide, the green line shows capacity greater than five megawatts. And again, the minimum is still less than a megawatt. So this capacity is, is, is you know, is good. Um, there also is yellow lines in, at this time indicating capacity up to five megawatts. And then, um, orange and red, also representing capacity, but as it declines closer to one megawatt. Also, the map um, integrates with the daily update, all the DC fast charging locations in the Commonwealth of Virginia, so you can know how close the chargers are in your planning areas. Uh, this and all the other tools are interactive mapping tools. And I'm gonna go on to the next slide for more information about the minimum standards that we are seeking. Um, and uh, the minimum rule just requires some sort of major credit card based payment system. So we are moving beyond the days of um, charging with a network only. There will be some sort of form of credit card, such as a touch free um, uh, payment system. And then chargers also must be Energy Star uh, certified for all the level two chargers. The EPA has a comprehensive website with all those chargers on it. Um, next slide. Um, all these chargers will also need to have some sort of uh, reasonable physical and cybersecurity um, components to their use uh, in order to protect consumer data from risk, harm, or disruption, as well as the infrastructure will need to be in place for five years. Um, the, uh, it's good, good practice to keep these chargers in place for 10 or 15 years, but the rule requires a minimum of action for five years. Um, for five years, there will also be a lot of additional reporting and um, public pricing information through um, some uh, state and federal systems. Next slide. Um, and the installation of chargers, this is the final minimum standard, will require uh, certified technicians, uh, capable technicians, and there is appropriate certifications or use of a national training from the EVITP program with just some graduate from that program and your grants can also pay for those, um, uh, those you know, scholarships through that program. Next slide. Um, just a note that we are talking about 
transitioning, wholesale transition of our transportation structure to decarbonized fuels by 2050. All energy in Virginia will be decarbonized by 2050. That includes the transportation sector. And so if by 2030 we reach 10% electrification, which is what the current laws and models uh, lead us to, that does represent about 91,000 more workplace chargers that are level two, about 60,000 more level two public charging units, and about 6,400 public DC fast charging pl plugs, according to an analysis of the electric vehicle infrastructure projection tool and looking towards 2030. So we are at about the 1% of those public level two charging plugs and about 10% of the public DC fast charging plugs. So this is a reminder for all uh, to consider doing both in your communities. You may be able to achieve a lot of uh, wholesale and positive change. Um, uh, finally, just wanted to mention that on the next slide that we have presented uh, locality planning reports um, in collaboration with several localities, but also publicly posted for all major metropolitan areas. areas. We used the electric vehicle infrastructure projection tool to detail all these reports and just to say that next slide. Um, it is your moment. Everybody who has a interest in electric vehicle chargers and have has a scale of a project that exceeds $500,000 should apply for this. Um, I want to just be, be here as a cheerleader to motivate folks to begin picking up the pen and paper, pick up the phone and call, or um, begin preparing an application. Um, the federal government will allow you to plan and to do chargers, as long as your planning does not exceed the cost you're spending on chargers, there is some space here for planning while you um, for planning while you deploy while you install chargers. Um, and uh, uh, all should apply. Virginia Clean Cities is also providing a statewide gap um, program. I do want to introduce uh, Mike Scarpino. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with my entire career with Virginia Clean Cities. Um, and I just want to share how uh, excited I am um, that uh, Department of Energy and Department of Transportation are working so closely together. And I think it's symbolized um, by, by Mike joining us and, and showcasing these programs here today. Uh, Mike, please take the Thanks, Alan. Good to see you. Um, I really like that slide. This is our moment. It's funny, uh, as Alan said, I've been associated with Clean Cities for a while. And back in 09, when we did Recovery Act, and we had 300 million uh, for the Department of Energy and Clean Cities. We thought that was some, you know, historic number of funding. And you compare that 300 million, uh, and Virginia had a Recovery Act uh, project that I think Virginia Clean Cities led. Uh, that uh, you compare that 300 million now to 7.5 billion available uh, for these programs across the country. The 300 million. Doesn't seem like a lot. So I agree. This is our moment. So, hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Scarpino. As Ellen said, uh, I am uh, actually, I work at the US Department of Transportation's Volpe Center, but I've been on assignment since the beginning of last year as part of the new Joint Office of Energy and Transportation. And I am now the acting uh, technical assistance and implementation lead. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so, uh, in my 15 minutes here, I'm going to talk real fast. I've got about 30 slides, but I'm going to give for those that may not know what the joint office is and what we're working on real quick overview, real quick overview of the national electric vehicle infrastructure or NEVI program. Then the majority of the, the, uh, presentation will be talking about the charging and fueling infrastructure or CFI program, which I think that's what you're all interested in. And at the end, I'll talk about some joint office resources that could. Uh, perhaps help you apply for those. You can go to the next slide, please. So, because this is an active solicitation with proposals due at the end of May, as Alan said, uh, there are certain questions that, you know, at the end I will be able to answer, but then there will be a lot that I can't because I'm not going to be able to, you know, say, wow, what you're proposing sounds great and I bet it'll be funded. But, you know, I, I could point you to the direct, you know, Go to this page for that answer, and then I'm going to put a uh, address at the end for any of specific questions you may have. You send to the CFI team at the Department of Transportation, and they will answer it. Go to the next slide, please. All right, and then you go to the next one too. For those that uh, may not be familiar with the Joint Office, real quick, when the bipartisan infrastructure law was passed in November of 2021. 
along with a lot of the funding that we're talking about, the $7.5 billion. Uh, it also directed the Departments of Energy and Transportation to establish a joint office uh, that would work on these programs. So this is unique to the government. And uh, as I said, there was an MOU signed be between DOT and DOE back at the end of 2021, and we uh, got going as an office in the beginning of 2022. You know, the next slide, please. So this shows you the main things that we are working on, providing technical assistance, guidance, and analysis. So the NEVI program has been the core of our work to date. That's $5 billion that goes through a formula grant program. So all of the states get some funding to work on electric vehicle infrastructure. As Alan said on one of uh, his slides, it's to build a national network. But in most states cases, there will be funding left after the national network is built out to start, you know, filling in in the various communities around the states. CFI 2.5 billion. I'm not going to say a lot about that because that'll be the majority of our my presentation. The joint office is also providing technical support for a couple of bus programs. So the federal transit authority FTA's low no emissions grant program. So that is funding uh, transit bus deployments. And then EPA's clean school bus program, which is uh, $5 billion for electric school bus deployments. So lots of funding, lots of programs created in the bipartisan infrastructure law. You go to the next slide. And then you go to the next slide. So Alan mentioned uh, the NEVI program and just real quick, what this formula grant program does is it's uh, strategically deploying charging across the country, building a, a national network. Uh, the backbone of this beginning phase of the program, it sits on top of Federal Highways Alt Fuel Corridors program. This was a program where states were designating alt fuel corridors starting back in 2016. So the funding for this program is to build out what has been designated by a state for alt fuel corridors. And as I said, once uh, the corridors are fully built out, then the funding could be used on any public road or what we call communities across the state. You can go to the next slide. So uh, if you're new to this and didn't know, uh, the, the first round of NEVI plans were approved back at the end of last September. Uh, that unlocked uh, FY22 and FY23 fundings for all 50 states plus DC and Puerto Rico. Uh, Virginia currently has on hand a little over $38 million. And over the five years of NEVI, that's $106 million. So lots of information. Uh, a lot of states have been really busy uh, lately working on getting RFPs out. And Erin will be telling you a little more about that when she presents after me. You can go to the next slide, please. And then you can go to the next slide. All right, so CFI, this is probably what you're mostly interested in. So the CFI program, uh, $2.5 billion, and it's divided into two distinct pots. Uh, as Alan mentioned, there's a piece for communities, and then there's a piece for corridors. Currently, the um, notice of funding opportunity or NOFO that is out on the street right now is for $700 million. Split in two, 350 million apiece for corridors and communities. Applications are due at the end of May, so coming right up. Future funding in this program. So, a lot of people have, you know, maybe been caught off guard, haven't really thought about things, and are worried, what if I miss this? Uh, there will be more funding and two, three more opportunities on this uh, 500 million nationally, FY24, 600 million, FY25, and 700 million. In FY26. Can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so unlike NEVI, which was is completely focused on electric vehicles, uh, CFI, while it has an electric vehicle component, also has an opportunity to fund projects for hydrogen, natural gas, which could be uh, CNG compressed or liquefied uh, LNG, and then propane fueling. And as Alan said, for some reason in the legislation, it said that the the infrastructure is limited to infrastructure for medium and heavy duty vehicles. I'll say that most of the propane offerings are in that class, but even if you had a light duty vehicle, 
you know, if it can fund medium and heavy duty, it could certainly uh, fund light duty too. So I don't feel like anybody's being left out with this. You can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so uh, two buckets. This starts to get confusing. So here we are talking about the community grant program. So the award side here, uh, the minimum award is five hundred thousand. So this wouldn't be a good program, you know, if you're just looking to put a level two in front of the library. You know, you'd have to have a lot of libraries and a lot of level two. So 500,000 uh, is the minimum and 15 million is the max. As I said, uh, across the country, 350 million is available. And this is for charging that is located on any public road or publicly accessible location. Uh, it doesn't say so here, but Alan did a good job explaining the differences. Uh, for this, it could be a DC fast charger, or it could be a level two, or it could be a combination of either. Um, it must be publicly accessible, so we're not uh, we're not funding limited access or something that you know is behind a fence. It must be accessible to the public. For these funds, you may contract out with a private entity. Must in address environmental justice. Obviously, the goal is to reduce uh, greenhouse gases and start to uh, fill in gaps across uh, the communities. You know, the next slide, please. So now we're talking the corridor grant program. So that has a minimum anticipated award of 1 million. And for some reason, there isn't any maximum. So you could go above, say, the 15 million for communities. I would just say, to think about strategically, if there's 350 million for the whole country, you obviously don't want to ask for all of that. Uh, so, you know, there really is no max, but you have to think about what would make your proposal competitive. Uh, for the corridor grants, uh, if you're looking at establishing uh, EV charging, it has to be within a mile of a designated corridor. For natural gas, propane, and hydrogen, it has to be within five. Uh, once again, publicly accessible for some reason in the legislation for the corridor piece, it says you must use the funds to contract with a private entity back on communities. It said you may. Um, so that's a slight difference there. You know, the next slide. And this shows who is able to apply. It's essentially public entities. So uh, private uh, companies cannot apply directly, but they could certainly be partnering with uh, these uh, recipients. May have to hit the next slide. It doesn't look like it's loading and everything. I will say starting at, on this slide, uh, at the bottom, I've added a reference to where to look in the uh, NOFO. The NOFO, I will admit, is very confusing. At least it's confusing to me. So I tried to capture references so you're not thumbing through all the pages to see, you know, where all these sections are. So this bottom uh, piece should be a good reference for you in the future. You know the next one. Okay, uh, cost share is 80-20, so typical of Department of Transportation uh, funding. Uh, I won't go into a lot of details there, but look at pages 19 and 20 of the NOFO if you want to deep dive into cost share. You can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so we're back talking about community programs. So the community program is looking at publicly accessible charging and fueling infrastructure. And as we said before, on any public road or any publicly accessible location. Go to pages 20 and 21 for more details there. You can go to the next one. All right, back to the corridors, building out corridors, publicly accessible, must be located along a designated all-fuel corridor. If you happen to have a corridor that goes through uh, tribal lands, they must be consulted before the designation. You can go to the next slide. And similar to what we talked about before for EV charging, we're look at, looking for it to be up to one mile off the uh, Interstate exits, uh, and then for the other alternative fuels up to 5 miles, you can look at pages 22 to 23 for more information there. You know, the next slide. 
Okay, so buried in uh, the NOFO are all sorts of interesting things that you should be aware of and make sure that you are including in your application. So on pages 26 to 28, they talk about if you're applying for a community program, uh, here are focus areas that Federal Highway is interested in. So if they're interested in that, that would mean probably these would be good things to think about focusing on. So multimodal hubs, shared use fleets and services, urban and suburban charging and fueling, Rural areas, so obviously there's been a focus on rural and urban and then fleets that serve and operate in communities. So more details on what all that means is on pages 26 to 28. Can you go to the next one? Which I believe we'll be talking about the additional corridors. Uh, yeah, additional things to focus on for corridors. So talking about how your projects would contribute to building out the national corridor network. Uh, particularly interested in medium and heavy duty corridors and resiliency, which when you pull the string, looking at what it talks about, that's for, you know, uh, building redundancy and resiliency into the charging network, you know, in the case of say a hurricane or you know, some sort of interruption that we would ensure that the, the network stays up and operating. And I'll just mention one thing, even though it doesn't say it, uh, because the NEVI program is focused on building out corridors, I would highly recommend, and Aaron will probably say this too, that if you're applying for corridor projects, that you coordinate with Virginia DOT to make sure what you're thinking about uh, meshes well with their plans for NEVI funds. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's another uh, thing that you know you should be aware of. So. On page 50, it says that priorities will go to community projects that are in rural areas, have low and moderate income neighborhoods, and then has a low ratio of private parking spaces or a high ratio of multi-unit dwellings. So those are areas that could benefit from public charging. Go to page 50 on the NOFO for more of those details. Next, please. And then here's just another high level view. Once again, it's hard for me to cover everything in the time allowed, but you know, the goals of the CFI program are on page two. Eligible project costs, you know, go to pages 20 through 23. The merit review criteria, very important. This is how they will judge your application. Go to pages uh, 41 to 59, uh, 41 to 49. We talked about the statutory selections. There's other considerations on 50 to 52. And then there's priority considerations on 53. So lots of things to think about as you're putting together your application. And I would keep all of these things in mind when you do so. Next, please. Uh, Ellen, I think covered the minimum standards very well. So I won't say much beyond the fact that the minimum standards were issued back in February and everything that was part of the minimum standards you know, will apply to the CFI grant program. So I think Alan covered it well, but if you're unfamiliar with the minimum standards, you can go to that link and uh, refresh or take a look at it. Next, please. And then also by America is a requirement that applies to CFI. So a waiver was issued by federal highway that talks about, uh, you know, the percentage of component uh, that are manufactured in the US. There's a waiver that lasts until July 1st of 2024. The uh, equipment does need to still be assembled in the US, but I won't go into all the details here, but uh, for CFI, you must meet the requirements of uh, Buy America and resources like Aaron or Alan, Alan could help you navigate this. Next, please. So this is the uh, address that I mentioned in the beginning. You know, we'll try to answer some questions here, but if you've really got specific things you need to know, that is the address to send your questions to. You can go to the next one. And then you go to the next one. So real quick on the joint office website, we have technical assistance, uh, resources, data tools. If you go to driveelectric.gov, uh, things are kind of divided up, uh, you know, under different buckets. 
we got states, communities, tribal, school district, transit agencies. So uh, lots of information there. You can go to the next slide. Um, I wanted to also talk about this is a product that's been out for I think for about a year now. Yeah, uh, the Department of Transportation's Rural EV Toolkit. So this is focused on rural communities. You know, where do they start when they're thinking about um, adding charging? It talks about funding, who you should partner with. Uh, it's about to be updated, but this information that's currently right there is still very good. And I think it's supposed to be updated within the next week or so. You go to the next slide. And what will be coming out very shortly, coming soon, probably also within a week or two, is a companion to the rural toolkit that looks at uh, urban electric mobility. So this is not out yet, but we hope it will be out very soon. And similar to the rural toolkit, it talks about you know, what are the best use cases, strategies, partnership opportunities, funding uh, to put charging in urban areas. I think I have one more slide left. You know that. Uh, we have a lot of webinars that we've engaged in at the joint office. Uh, lots of topics, a lot of topics that are focused on communities. So we've got, there's the list, shows you what's coming up. Actually, some of those are the ones that we already had. But everything that is um, we've had has been posted. So you go to the webinar site on the driveelectric.gov, and if you see some topics from previous webinars, you can watch those or look at the slides or join us for ones coming up. I think that might be it if you go to the last slide. Yep, that is it for me. Thank you, Mike. There's just Thank some more Mike. links for CFI. Yep. I'm going to make one more all hands commercial for putting questions into the chat, I'm sorry, into the uh, question uh, feature um, or uh, as you see fit. But I also want to introduce our next speaker. Um, Aaron Belt with VDOT has, doesn't have her title in her uh, chat line or on the first slide, but she is the decarbonization lead for VDOT. And I just want to reiterate how important that is. Oh, it is, it is in the, in the slide, but decarbonization lead, um, is super important for the Commonwealth, considering that our our law, for better or for worse, requires us to decarbonize all energy sources to net zero by 2050. We've got a lot of good work ahead, as the transportation sector is the largest source of um, greenhouse gas emissions, largest source of emissions in the Commonwealth. Erin. Thank you, Alan. Um, like Alan said, I'm the decarbonization lead for VDOT. I'm a part of the Office of Transportation Sustainability that just uh, celebrated its one year birthday in April of this year. So um, we're still fairly new, um, but uh, propping up the NEVI program in addition to the carbon reduction program. Um, next slide, please. So while we're here to talk about the charging and fueling infrastructure grants today, I did wanna highlight a couple of other items that fit into the greater scope of decarbonization and provide complementary benefits um, for the Charging and Fueling Infrastructure Grant Program. So we'll talk about uh, those programs, um, how you can be involved, and also some future planning and resources. Next slide. So with the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure and Investment Jobs Act, what are they? So the Inflation Reduction Act was signed into law just last year, um, and this provides $369 billion in conservation related tax incentives and reductions. So this is not direct to consumer dollars in your pocket or to localities um, and other municipalities and entities that are eligible uh, for funding projects. That falls onto the Infrastructure and Investment Jobs Act. So if you hear the term bipartisan infrastructure law, um, IIJA and BIL are used interchangeably. So they're not two separate bills, they are the same thing. And that, like Mike said earlier, is focused on uh, billions of dollars for roads, bridges, mass transit, and including resilience and broadband. Um, if you were to visit the IIJA website, it'll detail more than 200,000 projects that have already been awarded funding and does highlight some of those. Next slide. So with the Inflation Reduction Act, these do have direct to consumer benefits for clean energy and transportation. So if you are considering or your family or your business are considering um, uh, purchasing electric vehicles, there are tax credits available for new vehicles 
as well as uh, used vehicles, in addition to tax credits for rooftop solar. Uh, keep in mind that there are some income limits for these tax, um, uh, tax deductions. Um, so you'd contact your professional um, tax preparation firm or individuals to get feedback on that. Um, if you're a larger business and you're interested in utility scale solar, wind turbines and battery plants, there are also tax credits and energy credits and deductions for those as well. Next slide. So with the Infrastructure and Investment Jobs Act, that is what houses the NEVI, NEVI formula program and the corridor and community charging programs that make up the CFI discretionary grant programs. And like Mike and Ellen both said, the CFI grant program covers more than just electrification, also covers infrastructure for hydrogen, propane, and natural gas. Next slide. Wanted to give you a timeline of the NEVI program. Um, this is the program that has formula funding allocated to Virginia. Like Mike mentioned, um, the formula program guidance was issued in February of 2022. All states were required to submit their deployment plans by August 1st of 2022. All the plans were then approved, formula funding was unlocked, and where we are right now is the final standards and requirements became effective at the end of March. Next slide. So with Virginia's deployment plan, Virginia is the lead agency under the guidance of the Secretary of Transportation. Not all states are operating their program this way. Some states are operating out of their energy office or their regulatory office, but this is how we're operating in Virginia. Our deployment plan was approved in September um, on the 27th of last year. And then we've got money over five years to build out our alternative fuel corridors with available funding in FY 22 and 23 right now. Um, in terms of deploying the dollars for this infrastructure to be installed, we are currently developing a competitive process to award this and hope to have that solicitation for funding open later this summer. Next slide. So right now uh, we have uh, eight different alternative fuel corridors nominated and designated as um, alternative fuel corridors in Virginia. It's roughly 985 miles and they span um, uh, the interstates listed um, on the slide here. Um, for purposes of phase one of NEVI, um, having those compliance stations no more than 50 miles apart, no more than a mile away from the alternative fuel corridor, um, I-95, I'm sorry, I-495 and I-66 are considered to be built out at this time. So once we get that fully built out, um, certification through federal highways after the remainder of our AFCs are built out, we'll be able to take those dollars that we have remaining as part of our formula funding and either provide redundancy in certain uh, corridors or take that money and use it um, on other corridors of statewide significance. Next slide. So this, these numbers were pulled in February this year. Um, they don't change dramatically um, from month to month, but if you were to visit the Alternative Fuels Data Center website, you can look and see how many public stations are available across Virginia. These are all charging port, all charging port types across all charging speeds. So when you look at that 1000 plus number, that's pretty significant. But if you're looking specifically at DCFC, the, the fast charging stations, we've only got 137 at this time. And roughly 17 of those stations meet the NEVI requirements um, on our current alternative fuel corridors. Next slide. I'm sorry that the title cut off a little bit there, but these are our existing and potential alternative fuel corridor charging sites. So VDOT is in the process of drafting an EV mapping tool that will be publicly facing. Um, the stations that look like upside down uh, teardrops with a little plus sign, those are the existing stations that meet the NEVI standards and requirements. The orange dots are highlighting where we have gaps in our system. They are not intended to pre-select sites. So once we have our full mapping tool available for the public, what you're likely going to see are um, the areas highlighted that are 50 miles in each direction from our compliance stations to help folks that are looking to apply for NEVI funding. Um, when that solicitation opens, it'll help them select the sites um, that best fit uh, their business model. Next slide. So Virginia does have a NEVI public uh, input website. We have a lot of resources there. We also 
um, highlight um, the rural infrastructure tool that Mike uh, talked about, the guide. We have uh, locality resources, we have um, electric vehicle resources, we have the CFI resources on its own tab. Um, so if you're interested in taking a look at that website, that uh, address is here and also in the resource section at the end of this presentation. Um, and I'll share that. Um, I think I think Sarah is going to be sharing these slides afterwards. Next slide. So again, this is our we have a portion on our uh, input website about the discretionary grant programs. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Wanted to highlight some of the key dates um, when the CFI grant uh, was actually issued and when the applications are due May 30th. If you think you might be interested in applying to the grant, um, either the corridor or the community portion, go ahead and sign up for a grants.gov website. The website itself will tell you that it may take significant time to uh, validate your account. Um, so don't wait till the last minute to do that. Um, VDOT is not intending to apply for CFI grants this year. Um, but instead, we're providing support to Virginia Clean Cities. So they are, like Alan mentioned, providing a gap application statewide and also um, providing teaming opportunities for localities and partners that may not have the minimum ask uh, for a grant. Next slide. And I think we can skip through these a little bit, trying to be conscientious of time. Some of these um, topics Mike has already covered, but keep in mind that each of the grant requests has a minimum ask. Um, and so that can be significant if you're not sure what you want for your community, either for corridor charging or community charging. Next slide. So I wanted to talk about how do these programs work together? So we are here to talk about CFI today, but all of these programs can work in tandem with one another. We've got federal incentives, for both consumer and commercial electrification. Um, the NEVI formula program itself is really a federal subsidy to jumpstart electrification. And then the CFI grants, they either further build out the AFC um, uh, corridors or they bring electrification into communities themselves. Next slide. So what does this mean for you? Um, do you know what project you're interested in? If you do, that's great because project readiness is a component of both the uh, corridor and community discretionary grants. Are you an eligible entity and might cover this earlier? You may not be, but you could partner with an eligible entity to make that a reality um, for a grant application. Does the commitment make sense for your entity? So if you are a locality um, that's gonna be applying for this grant, um, there are a significant amount of reporting requirements, post-construction, operation and maintenance, and data reporting. And then there's also the non-federal match that has to be provided with your application. I'm sorry, not with your application, but promise that you will be able to meet that non-federal match with your application. Next slide. So teaming and future planning. One of the things that I have talked about with several localities is that there's a, a hesitancy to apply this year. So if you're not ready to do that this year, that's okay. This is not a single funding opportunity. These are multi-year opportunities that localities and entities that are eligible can apply for. So if you're not ready to apply for this year, um, if you're not interested in joining a joint application with another entity or signing on to the statewide application that Virginia Clean Cities is providing, what you can do is use the time and the information that you're learning now to prepare for next year. Next slide. So I wanted to provide a significant amount of resources for everyone. There's so much information out there to digest, but you can find out more about the Inflation Reduction Act um, on the White House's uh, website, as well as the bipartisan infrastructure law. So there are guidebooks out there that have a significant amount of information about every grant tax incentive and uh, benefit uh, available. And you can reach them by these websites. Next slide. And these are the additional resources I wanted to provide. Everything from Virginia Clean Cities to our public input website, um, guidance, final rulemaking, the grant NOFO itself, um, including if you want to just look at transportation related grants, you can visit uh, Federal Highways' website to see those. Next slide. And then contact information. So you can either reach out to me, you can reach out to my boss, Chris Berg, or if you're interested in being on our stakeholders list or just asking general questions, we have a website or we have an email address specifically for Nebby where you can contact us. Next slide. 
I think that's it. There we go. Excellent. And so um, I, I'll just ask Mike if we can go back to cameras on position and I'll ask Sarah uh, to monitor the chat and the questions um, to go through some questions. Uh, it's, and I just appreciate everybody's time being here. Um, also, I hope audio is working out for everybody. Um, I noticed something in the chat at the start that some people had trouble. This will be recorded if you have trouble with the WebEx audio recording. Uh, Sarah, do we have any questions? We do. Um, I am actually struggling to get my camera back on, so you guys are just going to have to bear with my name for now. Um, the first question um, I'm going to send to Aaron. Um, we had a question uh, asking if you had any general time frame for when that VDOT tool is expected to be available. Uh, the VDOT mapping tool? I believe so. Okay. So we expect that the mapping tool will be ready um, at the same time that we are issuing our notice of funding opportunity. Um, so I, I don't have a deadline for that. Um, we're actively working on making that available, but it will be ready either just before or at the same time that we open up that opportunity. Awesome. Thank you. Um, the next question that I have, um, I think Mike is probably the best person to answer this. Um, we have a question that says, what happens if there is unspent CFI funds after the current round closes? Well, that's a good question. The, the funding is kind of no year money. So I, I feel like federal highway could roll it into the next year, but I really, based on the level of interest with CFI, I can't imagine there will be unspent funds. I really don't. Excellent. Um, the next question I'm just going to throw out there for anyone to uh, give input to. Um, we have a question that says, has Virginia published the requirements for the appropriate licenses, certifications, and training needed to work on this EV charging equipment? And so, I could oh, go ahead. Well, I could just chime in that um, uh, electric vehicle chargers have been installed throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia using licensed electricians and master electricians uh, traditionally. And then there will be some greater workforce um, opportunities opportunities ahead. Things like this program do require um, a, a state level program, which has not necessarily been directly published or the CF, um, I'm sorry, the um, EVITP online training, which is accessible at about $230 to all, to all folks. We are working on um, supporting other Virginia programs at our community college. And through other awesome partnerships. And did you have anything you wanted to add to that, Erin? No, I just wanted to make sure that folks understand that chargers installed with this federal funding do have a requirement for qualified technician, and there is a two-way path. So if you're an existing electrician, you can um, take uh, take advantage of the EVIT pre program, uh, like Alan mentioned, or through an accredited um, institution or um, apprenticeship. And we're working on those right now, like Alan said, with our uh, partners. Excellent. All right, the next question that we have, um, again, can go to, to anyone. Um, is there a resource that can be provided for the waiver of some of the Buy America requirements in the short term? I guess I can start. Um, so currently, you know, the waiver is available to read. Behind the scenes, Federal Highway is supposed to be working on some FAQs because uh, questions have been coming in on it. I don't have a timeline on when they might be coming out, but when they do, I usually will, you know, will send something out to notify both the state DOT points of contact, such as Aaron, and then, you know, clean cities points of contact, such as Alan. I will also say that uh, EPRI, which I can't think of what the acronym stands for, Electric Power Research Institute, I believe, is talking about putting together a list of Buy America compliant equipment. That isn't anything that the Department of Transportation or Energy has certified as correct, but it's something they're doing on their own. I don't think it's up yet, but I know they're working on that behind the scenes. And the last thing I wanted to mention was states have asked, well, how, how would I, you know, how do we certify that this is Buy America compliant? And the Joint Office is working with NASIO, the National Association of State Energy Offices, and AASHTO, the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials, 
to uh, put on a website that we have the EB states clearinghouse. Uh, if a state is say working on that certification that they can share amongst each other. So a lot of this we're working on. Excellent. So yeah, keep keep your eyes out for those updates. Um, and something that Alan mentioned too is as groups get procurement contracts available for charging, uh, try to make those writable. Um, so yeah, share the wealth of information. Um, you know, you know, I'll, I'll chime in one more thing. I love the subject of Buy America and there was recently one more round of closed comment on the other Buy America provisions for manufactured products. Um, and so everything, um, not just the electric vehicle chargers themselves, but the, the rest of the infrastructure that goes into highway building, you know, does, does follow these same rules. Um, and so want to be sure that folks are uh, level headed and going into it. You just want to be sure there's the uh, detailed American flag, um, you know, stickers and, Made in America, and then also you know sort of tracking back to the different different products. There are some mineral mineral rules that will be detailed on those uh, DOT and Joint Office and Ashto websites. But uh, we've checked in with some installers, and they don't think it's going to be too much of a problem to deal with plastic conduit or to utilize American made you know conduit and breaker boxes, etc. Just want to be sure, folks, if you're writing a grant, you know you may want to include a little bit of extra space in there. Don't just check pick the lowest bid, but Look at what is American steel on your um, procurement uh, spreadsheets. Excellent, great advice. Um, so this next question is directed towards Mike, um, and it regards uh, language on page 12 of the NOFO. Um, so they ask, could you elaborate on the public access requirement and how that relates to paid parking spaces and garages? Um, we've heard questions from localities seeking to install EV charging in garages that charge fees for parking, including mass transit park and ride stations, um, but that seems to be prohibited by that language. Yeah, I, this has come up um, and actually pulled up the language, and it seems pretty clear to me that it's not allowed. If selected for an award, grant recipients may use funds to contract with a private entity that owns or manages parking facilities. However, fees to gain access to the charging and fueling infrastructure funded by this grant are not permitted. That seems pretty clear, um, but I, you know, I don't want to steer you wrong. So, I mean, you could ask that question, but it, it seems pretty obvious to me what it's saying. Excellent, thank you. Um, and then the last one is a pretty application specific question. Um, how would someone estimate the cost of charges and installation and what type of documentation is expected or needed to submit with the application. I would say work with your Virginia Clean Cities. You know, typically in grant programs such as this, you know, the people evaluating proposals would, you know, look for some bids. So, you know, try to get some bids ahead of time, just to have a general idea what this might uh, cost. You know, I'll let Alan and Aaron answer this too. You know, you know, I think sometimes it's difficult to envision this, but a lot of times federal grants permit you to um, answer and say, yes, I would like this funding and then give you a chance to sh sort of show the receipts. We got this bid from this company and we predict this amount of um, engineering, this amount of installation for a total of this amount of dollars. And this project actually allows you to um, I think that the federal government wants to spend a lot of this. They do want to get this work done this decade, but they allow some planning and some preparedness over maybe the seven, seven years ahead um, to really get all this done. So if you've got a little bit of a gap, you can still submit all the information that you know. Um, if you would like information on public procurements, we do have them on our website. And I also have some boilerplate language with regards to uh, active costs costs from past DC fast charger programs in Virginia, costs from past DC fast charger programs in Maryland, some level two charger cost analyses as well. And we may wanna suggest that you add a little cushion to those, but with regards to um, showing the receipt, if you can't show the receipt or if you don't have a bid, um, you can look at public procurement information um, or look at similar costs that you have paid for um, similar sets of infrastructure, like a large, I mean, a, a electric vehicle charger is like a dryer outlet. So something that's like a 40 amp 
piece of equipment gives you an idea of what it might have cost. Um, and you could also just ask your electricians or your local vendors that you have on contracts. They will get you information, and there's still 30 days for um, for some of that. So I just I, I know I might have said a lot about the what you present, but it's really those those bids. And if you don't get those bids, then there's some other information um, that maybe we could even make public um, for more more information. And, and I'm sorry if I only focused on one part of that question. Um, and uh, as we've mentioned before, we will be sending out a recording of this video um, and we can share the slides as well, which will have contact information so you can link up with the Virginia Clean Cities team or ask us some more questions. And Mike listed some places to submit specific questions as well. Um, we have one, we are about just at, at about time. So I'm going to lob one more question at the group and then I think we will sign off. Um, and that is, would having charging infrastructures located on school grounds um, be accessible, uh, would that be eligible for this funding? If they're, um, sorry, if they are open to the public. And so um, from my perspective, that's a good way to get low cost for a municipality to get low cost access to property and to have used properties. Um, I would caution um, if you're expecting people to, you know, use the bathrooms, a lot of school facilities are also secure facilities. So it would be good if it was a school near some other space where somebody could, you know, walk in the park or use the bathroom or uh, something of that of that nature. Um, and there are a lot of school grounds that are in um, areas of the uh, federal targets for the um, in disadvantaged communities that might be might be worth checking out. There's also other programs for school benefit. And so I'd hope that folks interested in school programs would check in with the energy office or reach out to Virginia Clean Cities for other potential school programs. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and like I said, we are just about at time now. We're actually two minutes over. So I want to say thank you to our great speakers and for everyone who attended today and asked questions. Um, we'll try to get this recording turned around to you guys shortly because we know that there's less than a month now to get these applications in. So best of luck to everyone who is submitting um, and let us know if we can help.